behind every great product is a great seal. Join us at the crossroads of preeminent product design engineering, seal mastery, and supply chain excellence, and learn from the makers of our future. Hello, welcome to Makers of Our Future. I'm excited you're here to join us uh, for conversations with the people behind the products that are changing the world. Uh, we put this podcast together uh, to form a searchable store of knowledge uh, to help out up and coming designers working with SEALs get to grips with what they need to do. Okay, let's get started. My name is Bill Sharrett, and I'm your host for today. I'm Senior Vice President of Business Development at Darkoid. And Meet my guest, Darren Peddle. Darren is an experienced SEAL industry veteran with over 20 years in engineering uh, before moving, uh, attaining the level of product engineering manager at a prestigious division of Parker Hannafin uh, before moving on to the medical products field. So welcome, Darren. Thanks, Bill. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. Um, I enjoyed working with you in the past. I was a little sad when you left uh, Parker, but I'm delighted you could uh, join the show today. So it's excellent. I'm going to hurl my first question at you. Um, so you got your, how did you get, how did you get into the seal industry? It's kind of um, not on everyone's career wish list, I think, when they're going through school. What was, what's your story? So uh, probably no different than most people. Um, I wasn't looking to get into the rubber industry either. Uh, in fact, when I joined, um, so I, I started in um, some automotive products in southern Ontario at a little company called Yo Rubber. Hmm. Uh, and uh, after a few years there, I had an opportunity to move to Freudenburg and OK in New Hampshire. OK. Uh, Freudenburg, I had the option of working on either plastic or rubber components. And I selected plastics. And then within a week or so, the rubber engineer quit and they had an urgent need. And guess who fell into the rubber products? Okay. Right. And then proceeded to spend about the next 20 years there. So uh, uh, with, with Yo, I had experience in both plastic and rubber. So you know, they, uh, Freudenberg decided that uh, they had the greater need on the rubber side. So that's where I ended up. Okay. Excellent. So what got... What, how about your education? Uh, where did you go to school? University of Waterloo. It's uh, about an hour west of Toronto. Um, mechanical engineering back in the early 90s. Okay. And so they uh, they taught you a lot of SEAL uh, knowledge? Or I, I where seem, did you learn SEAL? I, I seem to recall there was maybe 45 minutes out of my <laughs> university career spent on the other. <laughs> so... That's, I think, typical. Uh, that's something that we hear about all the time. Another reason that we're, we're putting this uh, podcast together. Um, what was it that you learned about rubber first that really gave you good good grounding in the subject? Hmm. Uh, it doesn't behave like anything you've ever, any other of the engineering materials that you've ever worked with. Hmm. So. Um, a lot of things, even intuitive engineers could look at and say, it's going to do this or it's going to do that. And with rubber, it, you just throw that out the window. Mm. Um, yeah. One of, one of the things I learned very early on is finite element analysis is a phenomenal tool for hoping to dispel what you think it's going to do and show you what it's actually going to do. Hey, we, we've, that's interesting. We've used FEA um, in many of our successful designs. Um, it's a great tool in predicting, uh, performance. It has some limitations. Um, but if you know modulus, say it's, it's, uh, tensile strength and so on. Can't you, when you're, you're just sketching out a seal and, uh, and theoretically applying pressure, you said intuitively understand what's going on. Where do you get surprised with FEA? So it, it's, when when rubber is loaded, you know if if you had a, a a steel structure and you loaded a certain way, you can you can kind of anticipate how it's going to move under those loads. Um, whereas with rubber, it, it it's got so much more flexibility built into it that things just happen a little bit differently. 
Um, finite element analysis is a, I mean, not simple shapes, obviously. When you squeeze an O-ring, you know what the O-ring is going to do. It's pretty, pretty obvious. But when you've got um, some complex seal shapes, especially ones that may be deformed rather than, or uh, flex rather than deforming or uh, compressing, deflecting, um, the, there can be some big surprises in just where they move, how they move. And, um, sometimes it's just not intuitive at all when you look at a cross section. What's, what's really great about FEA though is it enables you to look at uh, iterations very quickly. Whereas you might have to prototype something, uh, cut a tool, make parts, test them. You can turn around some very quick uh, concepts and, and discard ideas that don't go anywhere uh, very quickly and, and see those, those movements in the rubber that you couldn't otherwise anticipate unless you spent a lot of time and money to make those prototypes. Yeah, indeed. I remember working with you a while back. Uh, we looked, we w we visited the customer and we really got our hands on their application. It was an LED light bulb mm -hmm. um, designer and early days of LED uh, mass produced light bulbs. And they had a, a requirement for a volume compensating diaphragm. And I remember you you looked at it. And all the inputs that you needed to work with, and you kind of said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of model this tonight in my hotel room, and lo and behold, we came up with a, a very successful design. How much do you remember that one? How much modeling did you do on that to uh, get comfortable I with? Do, I do remember that one, and that one had some really tight constraints because the packaging on it was so confining, um, and there was quite a bit of volume that we had to compensate for. We really had very little space to do it in. So yeah, that one that one does stand out in my mind as a as a particular challenge. And the other one that was challenging on that was the material that we had to use, if I remember correctly, because of what we were the fluids we were containing and the temperatures and all that kind of good stuff. We had to use a material that doesn't like to be molded on severe undercuts and that type of thing. Mm. So a traditional expanding bellows wasn't going to happen. Yep. Um, so yeah, I recall that one. Uh, even the concept that we came up with on that one was pretty unique. Yeah, we turned the convolutes and the in the bellows ninety degrees. So uh, turned it yeah, inside out. And that one I, seems to me there was I tried three and four and five different con not different convolutes, but the, just the number of convolutes needed, and looking at. Uh, trying to manage the stress as the as the, the part uh, expanded to accommodate the volume. Um, yeah, FEA was really helpful for that, and you could also calculate exactly how much volume you were um, allowing, hmm. how much volume compensation you were allowing with, with each of the designs. So yeah, that was a that was actually a real fun one, and yeah. unfortunately turned around pretty quick and uh, worked right out of the gate. Yeah, no, that was it. Was it was good? It tested really, really well. Um, and tricky material doesn't like to move normally. Uh, not real good for flexing and so on. But uh, your design was outstanding. Um, Thanks. Limitations on FEA, though. I mean, I know uh, it can be difficult under dynamic when you got dy dynamically moving surfaces, for example, that the seal might be working against. Do you find you have limitations there or you know, all bets are off at some point yeah uh there, there's several limitations dynamics is definitely a whole different animal um that i really didn't get into very very much the vast majority of what i was involved with was static ceiling so that was a, a challenge for, for some other engineers to deal with yep. um one thing i did find was no matter how good your material properties were you could still only get it, it was far better at doing relative comparisons between designs than it was at outright prediction of performance. Mm. So, for example, predicting the exact loads that you were going to see from a seal, it was okay. It wasn't great. It'd get you in the ballpark, but if you were looking to dial something in, it wasn't fantastic for that. Mm. But if you were looking at... Uh, stresses for example in two different designs and it said that you were going to have 20 percent less stress or 50 percent less stress in this design versus another design or 
you're going to have twice the load or something to that effect. Now, those are great as far as determining the direction a design should take. But at the end of the day, I didn't trust the, the results as an outright predictor of exactly how much force that seal was going to require, that type of thing. Yeah, we always have to test in, in the real world uh, to make that final determination, I guess. But the, the fact that you can use that iterative process before cutting steel uh, is tremendously helpful. Uh, we've seen the benefit time and time again. Also... Mm -hmm. Um, I guess the more accurate the FEA is relies on how well characterized your material is. Um, you've really got to understand the unique properties. And so many times we're, we're asked to design a rubber component and there are so many families within, uh, the engineered elastomer realm and they all need to be within the families. There's different properties as well. So. Each of those has to be categorized before you can put them in the model. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and even more so than that, um, say a 70 durometer EPDM, one versus the next, or, or nitrile, or, or whatever the case may be, um, you can't even substitute compounds if you're trying to get some sort of accurate representation. Mm. Uh, you know, one, one 70 durometer nitrile for another, for example, they are, they're not the same. Um, you know, we use durometer very loosely in the rubber industry. It's um, one of the worst predictors of how a part is actually going to behave or worst representations. Uh, it's not really, it's very roughly related to the modulus of the part. And um, the materials are so nonlinear that it's it's almost like a point on a, a wavy curve, right? You've picked the one and compared it to, to another. Um, Compounds are so different. They're, they're individually compounded. Each manufacturer has their own. Uh, and even within a manufacturer, there'll be a lot of variation between one compound that's, say, a 70 EP versus another. Yeah, that is. Um, we, we found that critical. Uh, an, an FEA without the adequate characterization is we dismiss it pretty quickly. Um, mm -hmm. On the you talk to modulus. I think that's a. It's often shown on a on on a data sheet. People want to understand a material. They look at a physical property data sheet, um, and modulus is in there. And I think a lot of people over, overlook modulus. Can I put you on the spot and talk to how modulus predicts uh, seal performance? Say under a, a pressure situation, and we're talking uh, extrusion uh, and seal failure. Where do you look to modulus there to inform your your prediction, regardless of FEA? That's that's a tough one because even on a data sheet, you've got a, a single point representing the modulus. Modulus is a is a variable with an elastomer. It depends on how much you're um, deforming it. So, um, yeah, uh, even looking even looking at a, a single point actually called modulus is, is tough. Uh, but obviously, the, the higher the modulus, uh, within reason, you're going to have more uh, extrusion resistance. But even that by itself is not a great predictor. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, like you said, um, it's a complicated uh, material, mm -hmm. uh, compl complicated engineering uh, challenge. Um, so I'm sure you have over your career in in the seal industry had a lot of people come to you um who've got into a into a problem they've uh got too far down their uh product design path and they realize the seal that they hadn't really thought much about is proving to be a big problem um can you think about a time where you really saved someone's bacon or got a project back on track um by late stage emergency engagement? Uh, yeah, I could probably come up with one or two of those. Yep. The, the, the vast majority of the products we worked on were naturally engineered seals. And uh, occasionally you'd have a customer come to you early in the project, recognizing that, you know, they needed uh, assistance with, with that. But an awful lot of the projects we worked on were what you described. You know, somebody thought they were going to use an O-ring or, or something 
simpler uh, and really didn't plan for the proper sealing you know, parameters, seal height, and enough space to accommodate that seal. Yeah. So yeah, very, very often that was the case. But one in particular, and I'm not going to name names, but there was a company um, that uh, was producing a fuel tank uh, <clears throat> for, for an automotive OEM and expensive vehicles. And customers were coming home after filling up their fuel tank, parking it in the garage, coming out a few hours later, and the garage floor is covered in gasoline. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they weren't very happy, obviously. Yeah. So uh, um, I recall working on that one pretty hard to try. And th- and it wasn't our seal, by the way. We, we had not been involved with creating the original uh, seal. Uh, but they did bring us in to try and help resolve the issue. And uh, we, we did some analysis work and did some tolerance stacks and realized that what they had done, at least on paper, was created a fuel sender that uh, didn't overlap fully with the uh, the ceiling land in the fuel tank. So it could be offset enough that there was no direct compression line of compression on the seal. So they were actually seeing this in practice. And the seals were just kind of rotating and dropping into the fuel tank a little bit. And there was no crush on the seal whatsoever to, to create or to form a seal. So when we realized that there wasn't even a line uh, of, to compress a seal, we kind of sat back and scratched our heads and thought, well, what in the world are we going to do here? Uh, it's not like we can tell them, you know, you need to redesign the tank and redesign the sender so that there's overlap. There's cars out in the field and they need to repair these things. And they really didn't want to replace entire fuel systems in order to accomplish this. That would be an extremely expensive recall. So we came up with a design that we ended up patenting with them. Uh, it uses a Belleville washer, essentially, molded inside a rubber seal. So, And a Belleville washer is essentially a conical spring. So it's a flat conical spring. It's a washer, but it's got a little bit of a, a pitch to it. So on the inside edge, we had a seal bead, and then the load would be transferred out to the outside edge through the washer. You could press the seal bead further outboard on the bottom side on the fuel tank. Uh, leveraging the load across that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So that worked even better than we expected it would. Uh, the customer got some of our prototypes, put them in, and we drove up to, to visit them and see, see them testing them. And they said, yeah, this one worked just perfectly fine. And of course, it had been leaking before. They took it apart and showed me the ceiling land. And I said, had you showed me this in the first place, I would have said, there's nothing we could do to help you replace <laughs> the tenants. Yeah. Wow. So it worked really well. And it had a side benefit that it took materials, fluorocarbon materials that are uh, high fluorine materials that typically don't work well at low temperature. And it actually extended the low temperature sealing capability because the spring was still um, imparting force where the rubber itself had become solid. Okay. Did you know all that was going to happen uh, when you uh, when you designed no. it? No, yeah. that was just a, a benefit that we uh, accidentally discovered uh, after the fact. No, fantastic. Uh, there's so much to 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 bear in mind uh, designing seals and. And you talk to the land or the, the, the mating surface, the hardware. You got to get that right too. Uh, it, it sounded like you got lucky on this one, but um, there's theoretical surface finish, and then there's actually manufactured surface finish. So you got to got to pay attention to all the details, right? Yep, absolutely. Excellent. Good story. Well, well done. That was a checked so many boxes. Um, <laughs> I love it. Um, so how would you talk to your design approach when you look at or when you were looking at a, a, a new seal? And maybe this is a, a universal approach that you've used later in your career. But what's what path do you take uh, when you, you're figuring out a, a new design? Typically, the first thing I would look at was a tolerance stack up. Does that really yeah. drive the size of the seal that you need? So yeah. look at the meeting components, figure out what, you know, what they're made of. Yeah. Um, which gives you an idea of durability, uh, how much they're going to move over time, and um, 
kind of tolerances that you can expect to be holding if you weren't given explicit tolerances to begin with. Yep. Um, but yeah, getting that initial size of the seal, mechanically, that's one of the first things you do. Of course, you got to look at the temperatures and the fluids and, and understand um, what material you're going to be working with probably is the next step. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how often do you get a surprise? I mean, we, I think sometimes our customers get a little frustrated because we keep asking questions and asking more questions um, and then kind of sometimes have to circle back and make sure that the answer to the first question is still the same um, <laughs> because we've had those late stage surprises like you talk to the the, the surface finish uh, on that um, uh, fuel application. Um, so how often do you get surprised at the last minute? Uh, I would say it's the exception. But, okay. But there are some oddballs, though. And I can recall um, there was a, an engine manufacturer or an automotive manufacturer producing engines. And uh, they were complaining of a, um, a leak that they were seeing. In, I believe it was a valve cover gasket. And we couldn't understand for the life of us why this thing was leaking. So I visited the, the plant and come to find out they were using sandpaper to clean up a step on the machining process and sanding across the seal face. Oh, mm, perfectly the wrong direction. Yeah. So and you can imagine sandpaper. It's got the sharpest tip you can imagine uh, on the cutting edges. So it's creating a perfect V shape across your sealing surface. <laughs> Rubber's pretty good at conforming, but it can only do so much. Yeah. So yeah, those are leaking at a pretty good clip. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. There's always a surprise. So <laughs> 20 years, were you 20 years with Freudenberg before mo moving to Parker or, or how did that? Um, how did you move from 20, 20 years in the sealing industry overall. Yeah. yeah. So did you join Parker through an acquisition and? find yourself in the family or did you I did another out um, I joined let's see I joined Winds Precision I was there for a couple of years and then left and went to Goshen Rubber okay and then Goshen Rubber was acquired by Winds Precision six months later so I was back <laughs> to Winds. is that a bit awkward I mean that uh, yeah I hope you left Winds on good terms <laughs> it was it was okay it was a little weird yeah but I don't think anybody at Winds was terribly concerned because a few months later we were acquired by Parker. Okay. And I suspect that was kind of the plan all along. Um, Winds and Parker, or I'm sorry, Winds and Goshen were uh, not quite big enough for Parker to acquire. But combined, they were exactly what they were looking for. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. There was a bigger plan in motion there. So then you uh, were working out of Syracuse. Um, and at what point did you work through the, the, the management hierarchy to, to the position you achieved? Actually, I was in North Carolina, um, and I was still working as, well, through that series of acquisitions, I was still in North Carolina. And uh, when the Engineering Seals Division was formed, I was the number one first engineer for that division. Uh, and then I think you know Tillman King. Yep. He, uh, he started working as an engineer as well um, for Engineered Seals Division. And, you know, the, the volume of work became more than I could handle by myself. Um, and Tillman was working at a Syracuse. I was working out of North Carolina. Okay. And I believe I was there for roughly six years. Hmm. And they asked me to move to the headquarters here in Syracuse, Indiana, to become the engineering manager and run, run the group. Yep. Excellent. Well, congratulations. I mean, uh, they had a lot of faith in you. I mean, you did really good work. How do you, what advice do you give to up and coming engineers getting to grips with a seal application for the first time? Um, what do they really need to know that, that would benefit them as they engage on that project? Listen to uh, engineers that have been working on it for a long time. If you have the, the opportunity, bend their ear as much as you can. Uh, don't assume you know what you're doing because of your engineering degree, because when it comes to rubber, you probably don't. Mm. Okay. I, I can rem remember running into younger engineers, uh, generally customers, that um, 
thought they knew what they were doing and would get in over their heads. And even when you told them what, uh, you know, what you needed to do in order to solve the problem, there were still some skeptics that thought they knew better. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Wrong intuition. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that, that again, that kind of speaks to why we're, we're doing this, why we're having this conversation, because, um, uh, having the luxury of joining a company where there is that, uh, that knowledge and experience and kind of, uh, uh, tribal knowledge, if you will, on rubber and seals and how to make them. That's pretty rare unless you're actually in a rubber manufacturing company. We see it in some, obviously some, um, larger companies where rubber is a very important part of the product, but so often, that knowledge is not there or it, it is retired out and, and not replaced at the rate that it should be. Or people are moving job hopping so fast that those, uh, centers of excellence can't build up. Um, yeah. So hopefully following your advice, find someone who, who knows there are resources Absolutely. out there on the web. Um, I'll well, and honestly, if, if I was given advice to young me and I wasn't working in the rubber industry, but working somewhere else and I needed rubber parts and it was critical in my application, I'd be calling somebody like you guys. Um, Thank you. Because you really do need somebody who knows their way around rubber. You're not going to figure it out on your own. Uh, I mean, unless you're doing something extremely simple and you're looking through the Parker Rubbering Handbook and you can follow exactly what's in there. Um, but you, even... After my career in the rubber industry, I've, I've gone into places where somebody has been working on a rubber part and, you know, intelligent people, good engineers, uh, and they have been struggling with something for months, if not a year. And, uh, you go, what are you working on? And, you know, ask a few questions, you know, try this right here. Mm -hmm. And, and for, I, I actually had that experience last summer. Uh, with an employer where I walked in on something they had been working on developing for at least six months. And uh, I took, it was a flat rubber gasket. Uh, I took it over to a workbench with an exacto knife and a ruler and I cut it up and I put it back in the application and it did exactly what they needed it to do in the span of about 10 minutes. Um, you know, like I said, intelligent guys, but you just don't know rubber uh and it's all the, all the tips and tricks and, and techniques that you learn over the years you only get that working in the rubber industry working with the material it's it's not something you're going to pick up out of a textbook yeah when i when i started um my mentor in the industry he said it i need i need to know you're going to be with us for five years because it's going to take you at least two years to get halfway knowledgeable and asking the right questions, let alone with coming up with solutions. So, and he was right. And I'm still learning and we see new applications every day that um, make it a really exciting industry to, to be in. Um, we get to look at every technology out there. It's super. Um, I know we're kind of running out of time a little bit, but um, I like to say, uh, talking to, you know, the, the depth of knowledge that's built up, um, we kind of stand on the shoulders of giants in this industry. Um, uh, who gave you your best advice? Uh, what was it? And does it still, does it still ring true today? Um, I think probably Len Barnes. Hmm. I'm sure you know Len. I know Len. Yep. And uh, Len, Len was in the rubber industry for years and years. I'm not sure if he's retired yet. I haven't spoken to him in quite a while. Uh, but uh, he, he was a mentor to me for sure. Uh, and I don't know if there's any one thing that, that stands out in my mind uh, as, as advice, but the way he treated people uh, was probably, I mean, that really stuck in my mind. He was a Southern gentleman for sure. Really, really enjoyed working. Dignity and respect. Yep. yep. Excellent. Um, it is talking about brain drain. The, the the rubber industry lost a great brain when you moved on, but you moved out into the the medical device field. How has that transition 
Um, what could you take with you uh, from the rubber industry and in terms of your approach and style and management and so on? Um, congratulations on making the jump. I know you've been, got a lot out of it. Uh, how's it been? It, it's been excellent. Uh, I've been fortunate to be involved with uh, some really cool product developments and actually launch some some things, which is uh, not easy to do uh, all the time in, in the medical device career because some of the products do take quite a long time from cons- from concept through product launch. Uh, I joined uh, Depu Synthes in 2012 mm. as a project manager. And the reason I joined as a project manager and not a product engineer was I recognized that I had a lot to learn about that product line before I started, you know, getting my hands uh, into any kind of product development. We're talking so, orthopedics, um, yeah, joints and so on. Yeah, specifically hip implants. Okay. Uh, and we ended up launching um, one of the most successful hip femoral implants uh, in the history of the company. Uh, fastest growing. Uh, I'm not sure it's number one in sales, but I believe it is in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So, and it's clinically superior, proven clinically superior to what's what's out there now today. So that's pretty rare as well. Uh, normally, you get clinically equal to, uh, but apparently, what I'm what I'm hearing, I'm not firsthand because I'm not with the Pew anymore. But uh, what I hear is that uh, it's actually been proven superior. So yeah. it was pretty exciting to be involved with that project. Yeah, something something that goes on to impact people's lives in a positive way, and, and it's got your fingerprints on it and a mm-hmm. piece of you, and that, that that's fantastic. Congratulations, love Thank it. Thank you. Yeah, and and then uh, you moved ultimately to where you're at now. Is it Wishbone? Um, Wishbone Medical, which is more of a. Um, I guess addresses uh, specific sizing for orthopedic stuff, it does. right? Yes, it it's uh, pediatric orthopedics. Okay. So um, you were saying before how you get to impact people's lives with medical devices. It's absolutely true. Um, with Wishbone, we're actually able to impact kids' lives, and it's it's even more that much more rewarding. Right. I, I think that the energy uh, in the, the building every day is is just phenomenal because. People are there not because they have to be there. They they're there because they want to help kids. It's just a, an amazing uh, environment to work in. Fantastic! Congratulations! I, I'm I'm delighted that you're, you're you're getting so much out of it and, and continue to make an impact. So um, that's off to you, sir. Well done. Um, good. Uh, this has been a great chat. I would. Um, would you like to shout out uh, how to contact you? Um, is, is there anything at your current position that, that would benefit from some exposure here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Wishbone is growing. Uh, I'm not a spokesman for the company. This is completely me making these statements, but, uh, there are openings available. Um, we're, we're actively recruiting for people. So, uh, wishbone medical, I believe, dot com, wishbone medical dot com. I think, uh, I've been with the company about four months now, so don't, uh, Slam me too hard for not knowing the website address. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, if uh, there's there's some great engineering opportunities there, uh, as well as others. So if anybody watching is interested, please apply. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks again for your time, Darren. Uh, we'll wrap here. And uh, again, thank you for making a difference. And thank you for making such a, an impact and contribution to the rubber industry. Appreciate it. Thanks very much, Bill. Thanks for listening to the Makers of Our Future podcast. Behind every great product is a great seal. Learn more about how we can help at www.darkoid.com. That's D-A-R-C-O-I-D.com. The best seal on time. Zero defects, Darkoid.